My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary... Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Meowser, and this is Episode 7, Under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861-1865, to Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment. Last week, the regiment caught up with the Army of the Potomac and was placed in reserve upon arrival. With the campaign over and the Army of Northern Virginia in retreat, it's time to find out what happens next. Chapter 4 Scenes and Events in Camp McAuley Regiment spends month of October in Camp McAuley. Many changes in regimental and company organizations since departure of regiment from Pittsburgh. Daily drill, discipline, picket duty, inspections, reviews, dress parades, fatigue duty, roll call, and reconnaissance. Religious services in various companies, recreation and sports in Camp McAuley, company cook system a failure, first military funeral in regiment, emancipation proclamation read to regiment at dress parade, orders received to pack up and break camp, army of the Potomac in motion, orders of General McClellan forbidding foraging, General A.E. Burnside succeeds General McClellan in command of the Army of the Potomac. Grand Review of the Army of the Potomac. Farewell Address of General McClellan. General Fitz John Porter relieved of command of Fifth Corps. All of the month of October 1862 was spent by the regiment at Camp McAuley in the suburbs of Sharpsburg on the banks of the Potomac where the boys really first became acquainted with their company officers. The regimental organization with the company formations had been subjected to many changes in the short time elapsing from the departure of the regiment from Pittsburgh. Major John H. Kane was commissioned lieutenant colonel. Captain A. L. Pearson was promoted to major. Lieutenant Frank J. Burchard became captain of Company A., and Lieutenant E. A. Montooth became adjutant. Frank Van Gorder, who had been commissioned captain of Company E, was appointed quartermaster of the regiment, and in his place Lieutenant Joseph B. Sackett became captain of Company E. Corporal William B. Glass of Company F was the first commissary sergeant of the regiment, and served as such during the entire term of service. Sergeant John H. Ralston of Company F was made quartermaster sergeant, Hodden Marshall, Private and Company F in this camp, became Principal Musician, as the important office of Drum Major was known on the muster rolls. Another officer of very great importance to the regiment, although not known at all on the Army payrolls, made his appearance in this camp and conducted a flourishing business, that of Regimental Suitler, a very necessary office, which was held by Samuel Pollock of Pittsburgh, aided and abetted by William Robinson and Gilbert McMasters, and subsequently by Ed F. Pearson. This settler quartet composed a jolly set, and besides their stores of eatables, they contributed much to the good humor and entertainment in the camp. Between the sickness caused by exposure and scarcity of food and medicines supplied by the government in Camp Macaulay, and the bill of fare consisting of canned stuff and venerable eggs, and sturdy pies, supplied by the Sutler, it became a question which cause contributed most to the population of the hospitals in the camp. The settlers accommodated the soldiers with a line of credit, taking as collateral security orders on the monthly payrolls from their customers. During the six weeks' occupancy of this camp, which may be said to be the formative period of the regiment from the raw and fresh material composing it, 
to the development of the soldier by the daily drills, discipline, picket duty, inspections, reviews, dress parades, fatigue duty, roll calls, and reconnaissances. Attention was also paid to having company cooks and frequent policing of camp during this period. Chaplain appointed. Religious services. As has been said, the regiment was entirely without a chaplain or spiritual guidance the first few months of its service, until the Reverend John M. Thomas was appointed chaplain. December 28, 1862, this however did not deprive the regiment from previously holding very frequent religious services in the various companies. Company K from Armstrong and H and G from Clarion County, it may be said, set the first example of prayer meetings and the singing of religious hymns each evening after drills, and especially on each Sunday. The city companies, while possessed of many most exemplary Christian youths, did not shine so conspicuously or seriously in devotional exercises as did their rural companions. Reverend John B. Clark of Allegheny, a minister of the United Presbyterian Church and colonel of the 123rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, in the same camp and brigade of Humphrey's division, had an unusual number of young men, professed Christians, in his regiment. On Sundays, many of the officers and soldiers of the 155th and neighboring regiments attended his preaching until the regiment succeeded in securing a regular chaplain. Colonel Allen in this camp issued an order that as many of the regiment professed the Catholic faith, they had his permission, and indeed his earnest recommendation, to attend divine service each Sunday in the adjoining camp of General Meagher's Irish Brigade were chaplains of that faith held services. As a result, the regiment might be said to have fared very well in the matter of religious instruction. On the other hand, recreations and sports were not overlooked while in this camp. The violins and musical instruments, which had made Camp Howe so full of pleasant memories, were often produced in this camp, and the strains of music were frequently heard until late hours or until what was called tattoo, sounded. Colonel Allen, Lieutenant Colonel Kane, Major Pearson, and Adjutant Montooth, Sergeant Harry Campbell, and G.O.P. Fulton, and many non-commissioned officers, were good singers, and at regimental headquarters, an impromptu glee club could nightly be heard at this camp on the banks of the Potomac. One afternoon, the entire regiment not on duty and many of the officers adjourned to a grove to witness a set two in a ring, arranged between two privates who had a dispute according to the Marquis of Queensbury rules of the London prize ring. A rope was arranged and ring formed, seconds chosen, and a referee selected in approval form. Two boy gladiators came into the arena, each frowning at each other, threw off their blouses, rolled up their sleeves, took hitches in their belts, and glared at each other from their corners as they took seats on camp stools provided for the occasion. In addition to bottle holders, a large bucket of water and horse sponges procured from a corral nearby were placed in position for use. When all was ready, a commotion was heard in the crowd, which was compelled to open ranks a space back, while two other soldiers carried on their shoulders a large hickory pole which they deposited in the center of the ring. Principal musician Hodden Marshall was timekeeper for this occasion and gave the signal for the contest to open. The parties took their positions and the combat was about to begin when it was discovered that the fight was to be across a pole, either end of which was held by friends of the warriors, mutually chosen. One selected Sergeant McGimsey and the other Jimmy O'Neill. Time being called. The boy fighters proceeded in true prize ring style to spar for positions and to reach out and tap each other as if they were knockout blows. Round after round, however, was thus fought amid cheers by the assembled regiment and visiting comrades at the elegant performance of the fighters. At the end of half an hour of acute pantomime work, it was discovered that the holders of the pole, across which the war was being waged, 
had entered into a conspiracy to use the pole to prevent either of the combatants from landing a blow on his antagonist, whereupon the referee, Sergeant William Shore of Company D, pronounced the battle a draw, and all parties adjourned, more or less displeased at the result. It was learned afterwards that the two boy combatants were in dead earnest and had challenged each other to fight. They were consequently much mortified and chagrined at the outcome of the contest, while all their companions really enjoyed the bloodless encounter. The estrangement of the combatants was of short duration. They subsequently became fast friends, and when one of them fell on Little Round Top, pierced by a rebel bullet, he expired in the arms of his adversary in the mock fight in Camp McAuley. In consequence of the harrowing and exaggerated tales of the sufferings of the regiment in this camp, sent home and published in the papers generally, the express companies were kept busy sending boxes from the homes of the boys containing delicacies and substantial food. Much sickness frequently followed from indulgence in overeating the contents of these boxes as a result of the sympathetic action of the friends at home. Before leaving this camp, the company cook system introduced was found to be a total failure, principally because of the selection for the trying position of the most uncouth and disqualified men in the companies. As a result of dissatisfaction, company cooks were discontinued, and each mess of three or four comrades accepted the raw rations distributed to the companies and did their own cooking as messes. While in this camp, in the late October weather, the regiment had not yet received its full supply of tents or blankets necessary to the health and comfort of the boys. To supply this want, however, they had an abundance of cordwood and rails with which they kindled many campfires. To keep themselves warm on the frosty evenings before retiring, the boys of the 155th would stand around the blazing logs and rails with their backs to the fire, sometimes getting so close as to scorch first the bottom of the legs of their trousers and gradually burning them still higher, until at the end of five or six days the severe scorching affected the entire back part of their unmentionables, and big holes were made in the garment. At this period, also requisitions for new supplies of clothing were very slow in being filled, and in consequence, many of the boys, on account of the condition of their army trousers, were prevented from drilling and performing other military duties. One day, the camp of the regiment was visited by Lieutenant W. J. Patterson and Sergeant Bernard Cole of the 62nd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, then in an adjacent camp. Comrades Patterson and Cole had just been exchanged as paroled prisoners. They had been wounded and captured at the Battle of Gaines Mill, and after their exchange and return to the camp, they were anxious to see their Pittsburgh friends in the 155th. In conversation, some time after this visit to Camp McGauley, they expressed surprise at the behavior of so many of their friends in the 155th in remaining squatted on the ground during their visit, and their failure to arise and hospitably welcome them. Comrades Cole and Patterson, after hearing of the condition of the boys' wardrobe, fully accepted the explanation and pardoned the apparent want of courtesy on understanding that the state of the wardrobe of about one half of the regiment, caused by their too close proximity to the rail fires, left them no alternative than to remain seated in the presence of visitors and thus conceal the ravages made upon the seating portion of their government uniforms. To show their appreciation of the uncomfortable condition of their friends, Comrades Cole and Patterson formed a relief party and gathered up a supply of necessary clothing from the more fortunate members of the 62nd, from which they helped out the scanty wardrobe of their friends, the new soldiers of the 155th. October 15th, was election day in camp, but there was very little excitement or interest taken in the state election. Abram F. Overholt, private of Company E, a native of West Newton, age 19, died in the hospital at this camp this day, and being the first death in that company, he was given a military funeral, ordered by Captain Sackett, in command. The burial took place in the Lutheran Church graveyard in Sharpsburg, around which a few weeks before the great battle of Antietam had raged, 
his comrades, digging his grave and lowering him into his last resting place, fired a military salute over his grave and marched back to camp. His death was due to typhoid fever, a disease to which a great many other soldiers in Humphrey's division had fallen victims. It was in the latter days of September, while the regiment was in Camp Nicali, that the great Emancipation Proclamation was issued by President Lincoln and read to the various regiments in camp, at dress parade, by orders of General McClellan, Commander-in-Chief. It is now a matter of history that this great war measure would have been proclaimed at an earlier date, but the disasters of the Union Army in the summer of 1862 caused its postponement until the Union armies had won a victory. President Lincoln followed the proclamation returning the thanks of the government and nation to General McClellan and his troops for the victory of Antietam and repulsing the Confederate invaders and driving them south of the Potomac. Officers and men of the Army of the Potomac received with delight the tidings of this great war measure as a most opportune blow to the Confederate cause and its cornerstone, human slavery. Army in Motion October 30th, 1862, was memorable because of the orders received from General McClellan to pack up, break camp, and resume the march and an active campaign against the enemy. The large number of convalescent sick were placed in ambulances and sent to Frederick, Maryland, and other points for further treatment. Humphrey's division marched through Sharpsburg, continuing on their way until night. The next morning, the army was resumed, and at noon the division reached Sandy Hook, the whole Army of the Potomac being in motion. The Potomac River was crossed at Harper's Ferry on pontoons, the first the regiment had ever seen, presenting a sight most remarkable in its grandeur of scenery, as well as a moving picture of the magnificent army of nearly 100,000 men in motion, engaged in the opening demonstration of another campaign. The army was in fine spirits, and had recovered from any demoralizing effects involved in the disasters of the peninsula and the defeats in the Second Battle of Bull Run, and as General McClellan and staff rode by, the cheers that greeted him were as cordial as ever. Harper's Ferry, which the new troops saw for the first time, presented a singular sight. The United States arsenal, which had been blown up and destroyed a year before, was the most conspicuous object visible. Huge piles of gun barrels, bayonets, and shells, taken from the ruins, were piled up and stacked in the arsenal grounds. The historic engine house, at which John Brown and his party made the famous stand at Harper's Ferry, and where Colonel R. E. Lee, USA, succeeded in capturing Brown and his party but a few years before, also attracted very great attention from the Union troops as they marched along, many singing, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave as we go marching on, etc., Passing through Harper's Ferry, which was thronged with soldiers, McClellan's Grand Army crossed over the Shenandoah on pontoons, and the columns descended a series of hills for three or four miles on the south side, where the division again encamped on sacred soil of Old Virginia. On November 2nd, the army resumed its march and continued all day, halting in the evening at Snickers Gap, foraging and straggling. The disposition displayed by the new troops of the army on crossing into the enemy's country again was to forage and raid on the farmhouses and stock of the non-combatant inhabitants, thus inducing straggling and loitering on the march. General McClellan, to stop this, issued an order on the first day's march announcing that further straggling would be severely punished and that the business of the Union soldier was not to molest, but to protect the peaceful non-combatant citizens, and that their duty called for suppressing the rebellion and dealing with armed foes of the Union only, closing by stating that violation of these instructions, because being subversive of discipline, would be severely punished, whether committed by officers or enlisted men. With the heedlessness due to the youth and inexperience of the new troops composing Humphrey's division, it was found most difficult to restrain them from violation of these orders 
and as a consequence, but little attention was paid to the orders of the commander-in-chief. General Fitzjohn Porter, commanding the Corps, and General Humphreys commanding the division, because of the whole violation of the general order prohibiting straggling and foraging, announced in orders to their respective subordinates that they would be held responsible and liable to court-martial if they permitted or tolerated or did not suppress straggling or foraging by their men. As this order did not seem to affect the men or threaten individual punishment to them, although read to them on dress parade on the second day's march, it had little or no effect, and as a result, even more straggling and more foraging on the part of the new troops took place. Under the belief that they had immunity from punishment, chickens and fowls of all kinds, hogs, sheep, beehives, and other portable articles were coolly appropriated by the troops on this day's march. Houses were invaded in search for apples and fruits and vegetables, and many well-stuffed haversacks of the men indicated that their appropriation of the private property had been extensive. Straggling or dropping out of ranks to accomplish this result, of course, necessarily followed. The provost guard of the Army of the Potomac was composed of the United States regulars, veterans in the service, and it was said to be a most delightful duty to them, and a work in which they reveled. To follow the new volunteer troops on the march and to capture foragers and stragglers, found with private goods on their persons. As many as 200 men of one regiment alone were thus arrested on the march by the provost guard, with the stolen property of non-combatants in their possession, and they were accordingly, at the end of the day's march, corralled as prisoners into what they called a bullpen, where they remained under arrest until morning, when they were discharged. Strange to say, no part of their captured goods was confiscated by the provost guard or other officers, thus practically putting a premium on straggling and foraging. Several colonels of regiments, for failure to enforce necessary discipline on the day's march and to prevent straggling and foraging, were, as the general orders had announced would be done, placed under arrest on charges preferred of disobedience of orders. It was a drastic remedy thus invoked, because of the irrepressible desire of the soldiers and their belief that it was their bounden duty to forage upon all inhabitants of the enemy's country. Making no inquiries or distinction as to the loyalty or disloyalty of the population, the officers thus arrested were really not to be blamed, and should not have been censured, as despite all their efforts, their men circumvented them and disobeyed orders from the headquarters which the thoughtless youths scarcely comprehended. The regiment was placed on picket duty at Snicker's Gap, and served there until the next day, when the army of McClellan again marched and reached White Plains, where a number more of stragglers and foragers were arrested by the provost guards, composed of regulars, and with their captured provisions were detained overnight and returned to their regiments in the morning. At this place, November 7th, the first snow of the season fell, giving the camp a wintry appearance. The 155th on this day's march had its first experience as rear guard to the 5th Corps. The wagon train, which was a very long one, being composed of many ammunition wagons, quartermaster wagons, headquarters wagons, commissary wagons, and artillery trains, several miles in length, occupied nearly the entire day in passing. So that it was nearly night when in their capacity of wagon train guards the 155th followed it and marched all night over muddy, bad roads, about as intolerable as was ever afterwards experienced in Virginia's muddy roads and bad weather. The regiment passed through New Baltimore and Georgetown, and on nearly to Thoroughfare Gap. General McClellan, relieved from command. General McClellan was relieved from command of the army at White Plains on November 7th, 1862 at midnight, by special messenger from the adjutant general's office in the War Department at Washington, General McClellan's commander of the army was served with an order relieving him from command and substituting in his place General A. E. Burnside, then serving in command of a corps under McClellan. Had this order of removal 
been made some weeks earlier while General McClellan was tarring in camp at Sharpsburg and quarreling with the government for its want of cooperation, it could be well understood. As the government was impatient that the army should move before winter set in, but deferring the removal until the army was recruited, and in magnificent condition to strike a blow, was well on the march with the plans of campaign formed, and renewed confidence in its commander, it came as a surprise to the men under his command, who still worshipped McClellan and appreciated his patriotism and generalship. The Army of the Potomac, however, its leaders and men, were in the campaign for the country and the Union, and it mattered little to them as patriots what generals led them, even if they were only loyal and capable. That this was General McClellan's own view was clearly exhibited by his patriotic deportment on this, to him, trying occasion. General Burnside shared in the popular love and admiration of McClellan, and when thus tendered the appointment as his successor, hesitated to accept it, and declared McClellan his want of confidence in his own capacity to secede him, and sought the former's advice as a special friend as to accepting the responsible position. General McClellan promptly assured General Burnside that it was his duty to accept, that it was the demand of the country, and that he should obey, and that he, General McClellan, would stay with him, explain his plans, introduce him to all his officers, have a public review of the army in his honor, and in his farewell address to the army would commend him as his successor. All of which General McClellan did, much to the advantage and prestige of General Burnside. A review of the army was at once arranged, and it was a most remarkable farewell demonstration. The cheers and applause that greeted little Mac as he was affectionately called as he returned most gracefully the salutes and greetings of his men will ever be remembered. In the review of the army, General McClellan was accompanied by the generals commanding the corps, and General Porter, being always a favorite of the 5th Army Corps, accompanied General McClellan the farewell review being intended for both. General McClellan issued the following farewell address. Headquarters of the Army of the Potomac Camp near Rectortown, Virginia, November 7th, 1862 Officers and Soldiers of the Army of the Potomac In order of the President devolves upon Major General Burnside the command of this army. In parting from you, I cannot express the love and gratitude I bear to you. As an army, you have grown up in my care. In you... I have never found doubt or coldness. The battles you have fought under my command will probably live in our nation's history. The glory you have achieved over mutual perils and fatigues. The graves of our comrades fallen in battle and by disease. The broken forms of those whom wounds and sickness have disabled. The strongest associations which can exist among men unite us by an indissoluble tie. We shall ever be comrades in supporting the Constitution of our country and the nationality of its people. George B. McClellan, Major General, USA Major General Porter issued a farewell address to the 5th Army Corps, replete with patriotic sentiments on being relieved of its command, and commended the qualities of the distinguished soldier appointed to secede him, Major General Joseph Hooker. This farewell address was read at the regimental dress parades. An apparently belated order was also read about this time by Adjutant Montooth, purporting to be a letter from Major General Franz Siegel. In relation to having the 155th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers transferred to his corps, as in the recruiting days in Pittsburgh, many officers invoked the name of General Siegel as a popular hero of the hour to aid in recruiting. This letter was an explanation indicating to those who wanted to fight Mick Siegel that it was through no fault of General Siegel that their wishes had not been realized. And we will go ahead and finish up Chapter 5 next week. My goodness, this chapter was a lot of fun information in it, doesn't it? It's actually really enjoyable to read. Wasn't sure what was going to happen next. Um, the regiment met its uh, settlers for the first time, which are always amusing stories to read about. Settlers were basically men who carried 
everything a soldier could want at a price, of course. Whether that be a pie or a needle and thread kit, they made a pretty penny. And I might add, they still exist in the modern military. And I also remember them quite fondly. This regiment, or this regimental book, talking about how terrible cooks are, makes me understand that I can feel across space and time with other soldiers. <laughs> and the reason why that, that you have a lot of complaints early on in the war for this is A, none of the soldiers know how to cook any food. And the only cooks that you have are the people that you're coming with. So you just have to randomly choose someone to become your cook. I don't know about any of you, but I would be hard pressed to be able to cook for a hundred people. Even if they all gave me like, here's my rice and my turnips and some beef. I'd be like, I don't, this is going to be bad, man. I hope you all like stew. Soldiers getting care packages when they were at camp, um, incredibly important, especially at that time when the food was bad. To get some of that homemade cooking and snacks and treats, I've been on the receiving end of that, and I know how these soldiers felt, but sometimes you would just receive care packages, and I was just always looking forward to them, but I kind of had, like, I knew that the U.S. Postal Service was going to get it to me, you know? And at this time... There is a U.S. Postal Service, but everything takes a lot longer. I bet each each and every single one of those packages was worth its weight in gold. Also, the men torching their own pants to stay warm, and then staying on the ground because half the regiment had burned their pants off. This this might be my new favorite Civil War story that I have to tell people because it's. I'm going to tell that for ages. <laughs> That's just so uniquely human, but it's also something a new soldier would do. These guys haven't really suffered yet. Um, it's just the barest hint of hard times. <laughs> and so they're just trying to stay warm. Um, it's very much a boot thing to do. The Also, the amusing story about the two men boxing is one that I enjoyed very, very much. Emotions run high when you're in the service, and everything is magnified, so... I'm glad they became fast friends, but I had a similar experience, ex almost exactly like that, except for there was no pole to get in between us. Also, Major General McClellan, or Little Mac, trying to get his soldiers to stop foraging. What a return of events that takes for a few years down the road with generals like Grant and Sherman and Meade. Foraging became such a huge part of the Civil War, and one of the very interesting insights that we get is that it happened so often where soldiers would pay for a dinner or a meal or be invited to one, that sometimes they would get to eat with the enemy or to sit at a table that a Confederate had sat at the night before while they're out foraging. It's, man, it's, it's a very unique circumstance. Uh, also, I want to reread a small passage from the story to drive a point home. Quote, Officers and men of the Army of the Potomac received with delight the tidings of this great war measure, that being the Emancipation Proclamation, as a most opportune blow to the Confederate cause and its cornerstone, human slavery. This episode was supposed to be released on Saturday, but there was a storm during the recording. You might have heard some rain and some wind in this episode. My apologies. It made things rather difficult. But with that, thank you for listening to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. We will pick up Chapter 5 next week with Under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861. 1865 campaigns 155th pennsylvania regiment that's going to be releasing on december 22nd so my dear friends if you have not already done so also please like or subscribe or leave comments advice rate my show it doesn't matter have a great night or day and happy holidays they will
find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, no more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, he cried, give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue.